Hi, hello, my name is Allie and this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going, and what it's costing me. And wow, that copper cameo was really short-lived. I thought that maybe if I put a spread there, we would get more copper content in this video. TBD. I want the success rate of that will be. So I'm an independent graphic designer coming to you from just outside Toronto. And as far as knitting today, we're going to be getting into a finished object. Spoiler alert, I'm wearing it. And a new cast on. Because with this finished object done, we're officially delving into fall knitting, which I'm really excited about. Today on the tea front, we've got my mug from Courtney Zimmerman with the rainbow handle and like the blobs. We love this mug. And in it today, I'm drinking the Keats and Co. Earl Grey, which I've talked about loving on the channel before, and in kind of a fun development, I actually have a pretty significant discount code for you if you want to try it. Now, I want you to know that because this is my first, like, sort of blatantly monetized thing on the channel, I mean, whenever I talk about books, I do put, like, affiliate links to them in the description below, but it's not something that I'm ever, like, talking about on the video, so the most that you would have ever seen on my channel as far as monetization is just the ads that roll if you're not using YouTube Premium. So this is the first time that I have like a discount code to share with you from a brand. And I just want to make it really clear because this is new and I think that it can be kind of a jarring transition maybe when you've been with the channel since the beginning and they kind of suddenly start doing these things. I just want you to know that this is something that I have been really picky about. Like I have gotten other offers for other things that I have said no to because I didn't think that they made sense or were a good fit or were things that I honestly wanted to talk to you about and like say positive things about. And I mean, if you've watched my channel for a while, you know that I am picky, right? <laughs> you've seen this play out in everything I've ever knit, in me picking what to knit, in me not being able to pick things to knit. So like, you know that I mean it when I say that I'm picky. I have been picky in terms of sponsored stuff and I also very much intend to continue to be. You've heard me talk about Keats & Co before because I just like genuinely love them, right? This is a tea company launched by Sean and Hank Green, which if you also are like an OG, you YouTube nerd fighter. Like I just, the vlog weathers have meant so much to me for so long that when I saw they were launching a tea company, I was like, absolutely. I'm there. I've got to try it. I've obviously got to try the Earl Grey. We all know that's my standby. So I'm just so excited to be like a legit affiliate because I would say I've already been affiliated. In this case, Keats & Co. is just like an absolute perfect fit to me. This is not a traditional sponsorship where I am being given either product or money to say good things about it. This is just an unusually good affiliate program where they have sent me a few things to try and given me a coupon code to give you, but with zero requirement of me actually talking about it at all, let alone like what I say about it. I actually haven't even gotten what they're sending me yet. This is tea that I bought myself with my own money months ago and I've like talked on the channel before. I don't think there could possibly be a better thing for me to try to get you a discount on. And and if you do purchase using my code or my link, I do get a cut of that as well. So if you're interested in trying it out and you want to get 25% off your order, you can use code Allison Rowan or click the link in the description and you will get that discount, which is a sweet discount. Like now that I'm kind of like in the world of like seeing what kind of affiliate programs are available, 25% is like very unusual. Like the vast majority of ones that I see are 10 or like maybe 15% is kind of the high end of normal. So 25% is wild. If this is a thing you were thinking about buying anyway, definitely a good thing to take advantage of, particularly leading up into the holidays. Keats & Co is also wonderful because 100% of their profits go to charity. Like there is no millionaire billionaire who's just getting richer and richer as this business does well. They've so far donated over $8 million to Partners in Health and I just like good tea, good cause, good discount. Like what, what more could we want? And like I said, as for what I'm wearing today, this is our finished object. So what more transition could we need? Let's go. Okay, finished objects. So this is the Taylor, I almost said it's the Taylor Swift top. It's the Sailor Swift top, though, you know, I assume pun intended, from Veronica Lindbergh. So this is a pattern that accommodates up to a 59.5 inch bust, and I'm kind of knitting a weird Franken extra small, small hybrid largely by accident. <laughs> I kind of explained this in more depth in the last video, but short version, my gauge was coming out small. When I sized up my needles, I was feeling like the fabric was too open, so I didn't want to do that. So instead I just sized up to knit the small instead of the extra small I was planning. Then I read some wrong stitch numbers in the pattern at one point. Basically, my straps are the width of an extra small. My neck is extra wide to compensate to get everything else back to the overall circumference of a small. So the Sailor Swift pattern is regular 590 in euros. I did get it half off thanks to a discount that was going on at the time. So in total, this cost me about 440 Canadian. And my sort of gauge struggles were based on the fact that I'm knitting this out of Knitting for Olive Pure Silk, which just because it's not like a fuzzy animal fiber, it just sort of does nothing to like close up the gaps. And it was one of the yarns that the pattern mentioned you could use, but the pattern also sort of says like, 
you know, depending on which weight you want to use, because it does kind of allow you to use a little bit of a range in yarn thickness, you're going to get more kind of like drapey or dense fabric, which makes sense. And in retrospect, just as someone who's always knitting tight, who's always struggling to meet gauge and often having to upsize needles, something that was on the smaller end of the kinds of yarn, so the pattern recommended, I don't think that was the best choice for me. I think that as someone who's always struggling to meet gauge, I guess really like if a pattern gives a range of possible yarn thicknesses to use, I just probably have no business using one of the smaller ones. That's probably just a bad idea. That said, I do really love the fabric. I think though that to properly compensate, I probably actually should have knit like a medium instead of a small for reasons that we'll get into in a minute. So like I said, I knit this out of Knitting for Olive Pure Silk. I used two balls of the color putty and one ball of the color brown bear. And I ordered this from an online yarn store called Fia Fia based in Canada. And that cost about $50, but like 12 of that was shipping. So all in with pattern yarn shipping, that brings my total project cost to about $55 Canadian or about $40 US. In terms of actual yarn usage, I used up basically entirely those two balls of putty. I did have like a tiny bit left over, but nothing substantial. And I have, I think, like half the ball of the brown bear left. So the stripes really don't use a whole lot. And the putty, I was actually surprised that I was able to keep knitting as far as I did because I'd ordered my yarn based off of the idea that I was going to be knitting an extra small. And when I did my swatch and concluded that I was going to knit a small, I was like, okay, well, according to what the pattern recommends for how much yarn you want to have, I was going to have some nice buffer on the extra small. And it looks like I have like just enough on the small. So... We'll see if it actually ends up being enough. We'll see if it ends up coming up a bit short. But even then, I was kind of suspecting that I was going to want to knit the top longer than the pattern specifically calls for. This was a little bit hard to judge because I think as far as I could find, all of the pattern photos actually have the top tucked in into like fairly high-waisted pants. So you really don't know like how far it keeps going. And the pattern does specify a length from the underarm hole. I think it's 11 and a half inches. But until it's actually like on you, you don't really know exactly where that armhole is going to land, right, to measure from. So I wasn't really sure if I was going to feel like I had enough yarn, if it was going to feel like I was playing yarn chicken, but in fact I think I ended up knitting to like 15 inches from the underarm hole, which is quite a lot more than 11 and a half. So the fact that I still had plenty of yarn to keep knitting that far, I mean that I, I got a lot further than I thought I was going to, so that was nice. I do think that partly because of my tight gauge, my underarm holes did end up coming up higher than they probably are intended to according to the pattern so if they came down as far as they were supposed to then maybe I wouldn't have had to knit 15 inches of body to get it to the same length you know what I mean so hard to say if my gauge wasn't a constant problem maybe I would not have needed so much extra yarn to get it to be the right length but I still had plenty of yarn to do that with the two balls so that was awesome I was a little bit concerned about that going in and it was a total non-issue and I did still end up knitting this on slightly larger needles than the pattern recommends it calls for three millimeter needles and I use 3.25 mostly because that's just the smallest size needle that I had but when I sized up to the 3.5 I felt that it just looked too open and that was why I didn't want to do that to compensate for my gauge in that way so I cast this top on August 18th and as far as construction you start with a little panel for the back and then you pick up and do the two pieces of the front you join those at the neck and then you ultimately join that front piece and the back piece to continue knitting in the round the rest of the way down okay now let me stand up to show you what this looks like okay so here is the sailor swift top um, obviously tucked into a very high-waisted pair of trousers this is how I wore it out to dinner last night we are being we were being an outfit repeater today, but I really liked how tucked into a pair of high-waisted sort of like trousery pants. The top really does dress up pretty nicely. Like I said, I wore this out to dinner last night. This, this is, this is the exact outfit that I wore. I felt like it would be a good demo to show you the tank top, but I will also pop in some pictures of it untucked just with a pair of sweatpants so you can get a better idea of the actual length of it when it's not tucked in like this. So the last time I talked about this project on the channel, I was having some issues with my I-cord pickup rate. When I was following the pattern, I was getting some bunching because I do everything tight. <laughs> so I ended up picking up more stitches in doing my I-cord than the pattern called for. And last time I was kind of debating Okay, the pattern tells you to do your whole stitch pickup, like do a row of knitting a stitch into each stitch that you pick up, and then using these stitches you've all picked up, now you knit your I-cord. And having just attempted an I-cord where that pickup rate turned out to be wrong, I was like, do I really have to pick up all of these stitches again, all of those plus more, just to then start knitting the I-cord and like find out if this is the right pickup rate, and if it's not, then I have to take it out and do it again. Like the idea of just picking up all of the stitches several times in kind of a trial and error way sounded really, really horrible. And I was thinking, okay, well, when I learned to do an I-cord, the very first time I did that was on my Tecla top, and it has you pick up stitches as you go, rather than picking them all up. You like pick up one stitch, 
I cord it, pick up the next stitch, I cord it. So I was like, is there any reason that I couldn't do that here? Like I, that was my only other experience with an I cord. So I'm very not familiar with all the intricacies and the nuances of I cord. I was like, maybe this makes some difference that I don't understand. But I decided when I went back to do that I cord the second time that I was going to just do one stitch at a time so that I could see how my pickup rate was looking before I had gone to the trouble of picking up all of them. And it gave me exactly the same result, at least as far as I can tell. And it was much better for peace of mind and just like morale <laughs> that I wasn't thinking it. Like I, I don't like picking up stitches. We've gone over this. I hate it. So knowing that I wasn't doing all the stitch pickup for potentially nothing really made it a more pleasant experience for me. And then once I knew that that pickup rate worked, the second armhole, I actually did go ahead and pick up all the stitches at once because Again, I don't like picking up stitches. So once I knew what worked, I was like, okay, I'd rather get that over with so that the rest of the I-cord process doesn't involve picking up stitches, right? I can just get that over with and then just be knitting I-cord and not be picking up stitches as I go. So I actually did one armhole one way and the other armhole the other way. And again, as far as I can tell, they look the exact same. So I think you can really just use those methods interchangeably if a pattern tells you to pick up all the stitches and you don't want to, you don't have to. If it tells you to do one stitch at a time and you don't want to, you don't have to. And honestly, I think that what I ended up doing here of doing the first one, one stitch at a time and the second one all pre-picked up might just be a thing that I do on all projects from here on out because I mean, it, it makes sense to me, right? Of like the first one is you experimenting to figure out your right pickup rate so you don't want to commit to all the stitches. But once you know your rate, yeah, get it over it. So I decided to start those I-cords when I ran out of the first ball of my putty color because I was thinking, okay, well, if I have to start a new ball anyway, like I'm gonna have to weave an ends here anyway, I might as well go ahead and get the I-cord done so that when I finish this, it's like finish, finish. And I don't have this like annoying finicky thing to do at the very end of a project. So once I done the I-cord, I was like, okay, this seems like a good time to do a mid-project block just to get that I-cord kind of relaxed into its final state see how the rest of the fabric reacts to the blocking to know, okay, is it really materially affecting the length of this? And then from there, I can just keep knitting until either it hits the length I want it to be or I run out of yarn. But honestly, it like did not change materially in blocking. Like it is basically the same, like for better and for worse, I guess. I mean, I don't ever love it when things change dramatically in blocking, right? I find it kind of stressful to not actually know what you put all this time into making until you block it and like suddenly it's totally different and like ah this is one of the reasons why superwash is not my favorite but also a little bit for the worst because i think that silk makes like a beautiful comfortable fabric to wear that's really great in hot weather but it's not very forgiving of mistakes so there are definitely like little things here and there that i can see in it where i feel like if this were knit out of a wool you would not be able to see this but because it's silk you can so if it had been a little bit more generous in the blocking in that way I might have appreciated it that is just not what silk brings to the table it brings a lot of things to the table forgiveness is not it and neither is length this did not get significantly longer in blocking I think it was maybe like a quarter of an inch like it was nothing so that said I was kind of hoping after I finished the armhole eye cords that it was going to relax particularly the eye cord a little bit because like you can see the armhole is just a little bit like it's definitely like up in my armpit you know it's not uncomfortable to wear but I do think that I think it's kind of like rolling in the eye cord a little just because it gets so like folded up into my armpit. It just isn't like sitting kind of like rolled out and relaxed in the way that it like looks nice on the neck. And I feel like it kind of almost is disappearing at the edges here. Like these are the same size eye cord and I just don't feel like it looks like they are. <laughs> so I would have loved if it had relaxed just like a little bit here. Did not happen. So this is where I'm thinking like, it probably would have gone better for me if I had just knit the medium, like between the armhole depth and just the fact that this pattern is written to have some negative ease. So it does have some stretch to it. And I feel like once stretch to fit me, the fabric just looks a little more open than ideal. It just kind of compromises the crispness of the stripes a little bit. So like, if you look at the stripes like up here, I feel like they look because they're unstretched in that area, just more like crisp and solid than the ones further down do because these ones are getting stretched. And in stretching, you get a bit of kind of like the garter stitch effect where you can like see a little bit of the row above like coming through one of the loops. Like I feel like the stripes just look better up here than they do actually on the rest of the body. But this is also a completely nitpicky thing. Like I'm sitting here telling you all this, but at the same time, do I love this shirt? Yes. Did I wear it out to dinner last night? Yes. Like, <laughs> like do I think I'm gonna wear this lots next summer? Yes. So these are just all things that sort of, if I were to do this again, I would like to have this in my head. If you're gonna knit this, these are things you might like to have in your head. But all that said, I feel like I'm going to get a ton of wear out of this tank top. I really like this tank top. I'm very excited for it next summer or possibly just the next few weeks because I wore this out in a late September evening and was plenty warm. So thanks climate change. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like I feel like from a distance, like all of my little complaints about the stripes being a little bit stretched out and all these things, all of those complaints are really not very noticeable. Here you can see the back of it as well. From a distance, 
all little issues evaporate as with most knitting, I think. So I'm very happy with this one. So this project being done really kind of wraps up my summer knitting for the year, which I stuck very much to the book of my summer knitting plans, which I wasn't really expecting, honestly. I don't think I actually thought that I would get through this many projects in the summer. It's really been kind of a shock to me, like how quickly you get through summer projects in comparison to the bigger like fall winter projects I've been used to. And particularly like on the heels of my ginormous no frills cardigan that like the first six months of the year, like that's all I made. So the fact that in the last like three months I made like five different things and like what what is happening what is going on it's very disorienting but i really enjoyed knitting the taylor swift i feel like this was a really nice way to round out summer knitting it was very satisfying watching the stripes keep appearing and once the little back piece and front pieces were joined and i was just knitting around it was just so like simple and relaxing and def definitely a pattern i would recommend so since i finished the taylor swift top I have a new cast on and we're really abruptly shifting gears because we're going straight from summer tank top into christmas stockings so let me show you this is oh there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on here okay so these are <laughs> the beginnings of two christmas stockings designed by claire slade so the best part of this pattern is that it's a free pattern and also my yarn was kind of free so this is a great project because this whole project is free so picking yarn for this project was kind of interesting because i just realized as soon as i started trying to contemplate options that it's just an entirely different set of considerations than the ones i'm usually working with because my go-to's for garments are wool actually the sailor swift is the first thing i've ever knit that hasn't been some version of 100 percent wool whether that's merino or superwash or more rustic wool so this is my first experience using non-wool and even it is still an animal fiber right it's silk like one of the things that really appealed to me in taking up knitting was being able to use 100 percent natural fibers because i've just sort of found over the years that i really really appreciate the qualities that natural fibers offer the breathability the insulation the antibacterial properties like these are all things that i really value about natural fibers so anytime i'm knitting something to go on my body that's what I want to use. But this is my first time knitting something that's not going on a body, <laughs> right? This is just going to go on a wall and it's just going to hold stuff on Christmas morning. So I was like, oh, I actually don't need to like spend a hundred dollars on very fancy, like ethically sourced wool to produce this because it could have all of those benefits and it would do absolutely no one any good. So I was like, oh, instead of looking at all my like fancy little like yarn boutiques, I guess I just go to my local Michaels and just see what they have, which is kind of funny because I love my local Michaels, but I go there for like scrapbooking supplies, right? I've never actually bought yarn there. So I went looking, what I ended up getting was this behemoth of a thing, which allegedly is enough yardage for me to make both stockings out of because I'm planning to make two matching Christmas stockings so I can have them hanging, like framing my TV, you know? So this ginormous ball of knot wool um, is supposed to be enough to do that. So it is huge and it is Bernat Fluffy, Fluffy spelled with two E's at the end, because you know, gotta make it trademarkable. And it is made out of 90% polyester, 10% nylon. And it is so fluffy, like true to the name. Like look at the squish and it just, it's so soft. I'm trying to show you like the actual strand. You can kind of see the fluffiness, right? And however soft you imagine that might be, you're probably correct. It is extremely soft. It also definitely sheds a little like after I work with it. My lap definitely has lots of like little tiny strands on it, but I feel like it's going to give the finished stockings this really nice sort of cozy, worn in like hominess to it. Also, I, there's kind of a disaster of yarn here. Um, this is this is the yarn barf that has not yet entirely been dealt with so that's why this is here but the reason this is basically free is because so at michael's this was i believe 15 dollars canadian michael's always has coupons for like x percent off of one item and it's usually like 30 or even 40 percent that week it was just 30 so i got 30 percent off so it was like 10 bucks and then i had a michael's gift card because a while ago i had bought online i saw there was a sale on their like albums and because i scrapbook i always need new scrapbook albums and they're pretty pricey so when they go on sale i was like yes okay great and bought a couple and then only realized once I went to use it that it's not in fact a scrapbook album it's a photo album which does not have the kind of sleeves that I need nor is it actually quite the right size it was like slightly different size than the scrapbook pages so whoops so I returned that but because by the time I returned it I didn't have like a receipt or anything anymore they could only give me a refund like onto a gift card so I used that gift card and I bought this yarn so it kind of cost ten dollars but also because I used a gift card from a thing that I had bought like a while before, you know, like when that money is long gone out of your budget, you no longer think of it as yours anymore. That's what paid for it. So, you know, in my, in my head, this was free. So this pattern calls for a size 5.5 needle. And this is a case where I'm grateful that I never knit with the needle that it calls for, because for some reason, I only currently have one 5.5 millimeter needle 
in my set. I think that the other 5.5 might be the smaller needle that I was using when I was doing my cloud bow and I was talking about using a smaller needle on the left side just to keep things like sliding more easily and I cannot currently seem to locate that needle. Now that said, could I knit this with only one? Yes, in the same way I could use a smaller needle on the left hand side, but I ideally didn't want to have to do that because I wanted to be able to actually start them two at a time like on two separate circulars. So I was going to need both of the correct needle size to be both of the right hand needles and then I could use a smaller needle for the left hand needle on both of those. The good news is that when I started a little test of it on the 5.5 millimeter needles it was too small so I'm actually going to be using a six millimeter needle. I really wasn't sure though when I cast on to do that little test because this pattern just tells you here's the yarn that you use like this is one of those free patterns that is free because it's very specifically promoting like a very specific product so I was like okay so I like looked up that yarn looked up what it's like wraps per inch and whatever it is and then was trying to compare that to the yarns I was looking at in the store but I felt like I had less information to go off of than a traditional pattern that's like here's the suggested yarn but here's just the yarn specs you're looking for in general so I wasn't really sure if my bulky was gonna be the same as their bulky it was possible that mine was bigger or maybe even like substantially smaller because I don't know I feel like I feel like I did some projects with such enormous yarn when I was very first starting knitting that like this doesn't even feel bulky to me. <laughs> like this feels reasonable, reasonable weight. There's a new yarn category. So I really wasn't sure, but it turned out that it was coming out just a bit small. So I was like, okay, great. I'll size up to a six millimeter and I have six millimeter needles. So hooray, I can cast on two at a time on two separate circulars. So that is in fact what I have done. So again, part of the reason for all the yarn chaos here is that I am knitting out of both ends of the ball at the same time. And the one that I started second is the one that is knitting out of the middle of the ball. So the one that produced the yarn barf. And I, as you can see, have not knit very much of it. So I have not knit enough to use up said yarn barf. So here you can see my two separate stockings and I decided to cast them on this way two at a time but on two separate needles because I found in knitting socks for my dad, my dad who built the beautiful bookcase if you're unaware, is that I much prefer knitting socks two at a time like since I tried doing that I found the process much more enjoyable than knitting a whole sock and then having to start all over again and I mean I, I think part of it is the morale of just like ugh I'm done and now I just have to do all of the same things all over again like just the feeling of redoing work I think is just not a great feeling but more than that like one of the reasons that I don't tend to feel compelled to knit a lot of socks one of the reasons I really tend to only knit socks for dad because he really loves socks is because while socks don't take very long they do have kind of a higher rate of having to like stop and look at the pattern and like do different things at different stages than a larger garment where you're just kind of continuing with what you're doing for a longer period of time so when I would knit dad socks two at a time on one set of needles it was great because I only had to work my way through those instructions once right everything happening simultaneously. I only have to read the cup directions once. I only have to read the leg directions once and the heel directions once and the toe directions once. So the interruption of having to refer to the instructions and figure out what I'm doing was happening half as often, right, as it would have if I were knitting these one after the other. So when I was thinking about making these two Christmas stockings, I mean my very first thought was like, okay great, I'll just do it that way. But then in thinking about it, I kind of had the thought of like, okay, but these are giant, right? These are not the same as regular socks. And I was worried that putting them both on one set of needles would prove kind of cumbersome and awkward to maneuver and just like heavy and weird and I don't know I just first saw issues with it so I was like well, what if I knit them at the same time but just not like quite at the same time <laughs> like what if I just do the first section of instructions of one and then do it for the other and do the next instructions of one and then for the other and that way I'm still getting the reduced sort of interruption rate of the instructions without having the bulk of the whole project on one set of needles at the same time. So there's still a little bit of a feeling of restarting the work that you're doing, but at least you're only restarting a section, right? And not an entire thing. I mean, at least that's my current thought process. We'll see how I continue to feel about this as I work my way through them. But for now, that's the plan. So on this one currently, I'm more than halfway through the cuff, which you can see because if you see this row with the little holes, that is the fold line. So in that way, if I were actually properly doing this two at a time from the very beginning, I would have just knit the first half of this cuff and then the first half of this cuff and then I would have done like the funny row and the funny row and then the rest of the cuff and then the rest of the cuff. But I didn't do this quite immediately because actually at first I wasn't sure that I even had two cords short enough because this <laughs> the circumference of the stocking is kind of just big enough that I can do it on my shortest circular cord rather than having to do magic loop. And I mean, if my options are magic loop or not having to magic loop, of course I would rather not have to do magic loop. But then I found a second short circular cord when I was looking for my other 5.5 millimeter needle. Did not find the needle, did find another short cord. So when that happened, I cast this one on. And so once I get this one caught up to where this one is, then we'll start doing 
step one, step one, step two, step two, step three, step three, etc. I think that will just help like keep morale up throughout this project, you know? So as of filming, I only cast these on two days ago, so I've not gotten very far, and obviously these are also being knit from the cuff down. So this is the cuff, and this part is going to fold onto that funny row, like I said, with the yarn overs in it. And look, it's not going to cooperate very well because it's on needles, but you know, something, something like that. And then we get into all of the cables, which, so in doing my little test swatch, I learned that this cable pattern is interesting. In knitting my little test swatch, I was doing that in the cable pattern because that's that you need to in order to get an accurate sense of your gauge and these cables are going to be interesting <laughs> i don't i don't think it's going to be my favorite cabling project experience and i say that because this pattern has three different types of cable in terms of the number of stitches that it's using so there's an eight stitch cable a four stitch cable and a three stitch cable and then each of those numbers each has like a front and back variation of it and the four and the eight are simple, right? The pattern will just say cable eight back, cable eight front. And like, okay, great, cable eight back just means you put the first four stitches at the back and then do the other four and then bring them back, etc. And like same for the four, it just means you're doing either the front or the back, whichever it says, with two stitches because you're just dividing the stitches in half. So when the pattern says knit four back, you know what that means, right? Cable three back, cable three front, the odd numbers are a bad time because, <laughs> because on one of them, you are moving one onto the cable needle and on one of them you're moving two to the cable needle and if you think that i could ever remember which one of those was which no so currently actually sitting on my printer that i need to go grab is a little cheat sheet that i made for myself where i just basically copied out like a very abbreviated version of the instructions that i could just keep beside me while i'm working on this and refer to every time i hit a three stitch cable because what what do you do with a three stitch cable <laughs> And just to complicate it, like the four and the eight stitch cables, it's just all knits on all of those four or eight stitches. So that's great, that's no problem. But on the three stitch cables, like one of the stitches is purled and it's just, it, it just was not sitting well in my brain. And I think that the whole cable repeat is eight rows, which doesn't sound like a lot, but cabling is happening on multiple of those rows. So it, it just definitely seems more like complex than other cabling patterns that I've done before that have been a much more sort of consistent rhythm. They didn't have as many different sizes of cables going on at the same time. I don't know. And you know what? Maybe this is just a warm up for the menu cardigan that's in my fall knitting plans. I haven't looked at that one to know what that cable pattern is actually like. Like maybe the stocking is a little weak compared to that. I don't know. It does look fancy. I don't know, but just knitting this test watch, I was kind of like, oh wow, what have I gotten myself into? So I've not even gotten into the cabling of the actual stocking. I only did like one repeat of it just to get a general sense of gauge. Cause I felt like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a stocking. It doesn't need to fit like anything in particular. It just needs to be big enough to be functional. So, you know, maybe after two or three repeats of it, it'll just be second nature and it'll seem really simple. I will obviously report back next time on how that's going. But right now it's just feeling a little bit like, oh God what have I signed up for? And it is all written, it's not charted, so I feel like there's just less ability to just kind of casually glance and be like, okay, yeah, like that's what I thought was next, just checking. So yeah, I. it's occurring to me that I really should also print out a little cheat sheet of just like what the eight row repeat is. Yeah, I, I, think, I think cheat sheets are gonna be in order for this so that I'm not like constantly referring to this, you know, like multi-page PDF document on my phone. It'll just be much easier if I just have a little thing that's like this big that sits beside me. But yeah, so this is the beginning of my very, very fluffy, fluffy with two E's, Christmas stocking. Also speaking of the menu cardigan, so this is one that came up in my fall knitting plans that I'm planning to make for my sister for Christmas. And when I decided on this plan, I talked to my sister and I was like, hey, can you do me a favor and just find a cardigan that you really like to wear and just measure for me just across the chest like to the armpit like just get me that one simple chest measurement that's all I need and you know like I think a lot of people and like very basic quick tasks around the home that despite how simple they are seem really annoying so you have to like go find a measuring tape and go find a sweater you know I think this is the kind of thing that we all hype up in our heads it's like oh god like this can be such a pain in the butt I don't want to go do that and then you actually do that you're like oh that took me literally two minutes so like I presume most of us, my sister has proceeded to not yet do that. And I also cut her extra grace for this because like, I don't have children. She has two young children. She runs a business. She is doing a million things. She is keeping the sky from falling at all times. So this this, this is a thing that fell through the cracks that I 100% foresaw falling through the cracks. And for that reason, I had a backup plan. So 
I thought it was worth asking her because I think that her picking the thing that it's being measured from is the best case scenario in terms of getting the best number to work off of. But the next best thing is actually getting a measurement at all. So I texted her husband <laughs> and I was like, can you do me a favor? Can you please go sneak into her closet and find some sort of sweatery garment that she wears all the time and measure it for me? 30 minutes later, I had a measurement. And I also had photos of the measuring tape on the sweater, which is also really helpful because I think particularly when people don't knit, it can kind of be unclear like, well, exactly how precise is this supposed to be and like precise to exactly which edge on sort of a like floppy fabric -y thing, right? Like these are not geometrically precise. So I think that just having someone lay a measuring tape on it so that you can then plus or minus however much of that measurement you think is or isn't relevant, that's really helpful. So I got numbers and I also got photos. And this means that I now actually have everything I need to cast on the menu cardigan. So I think that's what I'm planning to do next after the stockings. I was initially kind of debating which one I wanted to do next because I don't want to be in like a time crunch on the menu cardigan again I do feel like it's going to be quite a bit of work but I also was feeling like it's still September and in my ideal world okay listen I do I want to confess this to the internet I am one of those people who decorates for Christmas in like mid-November I'm sorry I'm not sorry but this is just to say that in my ideal world I would love to have these stockings up this year leading up to Christmas and that means I would like to have them in November and if I do the menu cardigan first that seems a lot less likely to happen and I don't need the menu cardigan to be finished until December 25th. So I'm doing the stockings first and kind of trusting that because it's a bulky weight project that they're going to knit up quite quickly and that it will probably still be October when I'm starting the menu cardigan and therefore will hopefully feel like I have lots of time and space to do that. But I mean, we, we'll see. We'll see if I'm eating these words in December and cursing myself for having started the stockings first. We'll see what happens. But that is my current thinking. Also, as far as acquisitions, because I have yarn for the menu cardigan, I have yarn for my Colette pullover that I talked about, the Wandering Flock Cotton Lino. I have this yarn for my stockings. I have that yarn that mom picked out that I'm making into a scarf for for Christmas. So I have, I have yarn for all of the things in my fall knitting plans. So I have no business buying yarn right now. There should be no yarn acquisitions. <laughs> in the near future. I also don't think there's anything coming up that would feel like an unusual, like like Knit City Toronto was a case where I was like, okay, well, I'm going to a yarn festival, so like I'm probably gonna buy yarn regardless of what my like current yarn stash status is. But I don't think anything like that is coming up in the near future. So I think, I think we're good. We're just gonna, we're just gonna work with all the yarn that we bought for all the projects that we currently have planned. We're gonna be responsible. All right, so that's all I've got for knitting today. Now let's get into off the needles, where I talk about things that are non-knitting related, but still in the kind of creative world. So often that includes book updates. Now, last time we talked, I confessed to being a bit of a reading slump, and unfortunately that continues. Last time I was talking about putting down Lies and Weddings by Kevin Kwan, acknowledging that I just wasn't in the right headspace, and saying that I might jump to the new Casey McQuiston book, The Pairing. I did in fact do that jump, and I'm still like, I'm maybe like 170 pages in to like a 400 page book. And it's been like two and a half weeks. Like it's just, I've been kind of picking away at it before bed every night, but that's about it. And I just, I don't, I love Casey's writing. I'm always super into Casey's books. So I'm like, this is not, this is not a book problem. This is a me problem. I think I'm just kind of struggling to be in a reading mindset right now, which is frustrating to me because I love reading and I love the feeling of like being in the middle of a good book and not being able to like access that feeling is annoying. I'm not a fan, but in the meantime, in the absence of reading, I have been doing a little bit more scrapbooking. Now, I feel like there's something about fall. I mean, here's here's a series of connections. I think that those of us who have enjoyed the show Gilmore Girls know that fall is Gilmore Girls weather. And for me, what I do when I'm scrapbooking most of the time is I put Gilmore Girls on in the background. So I think that there is sort of a, it's fall time, therefore it's scrapbooking time that's <laughs> going on in my head because I want to watch Gilmore Girls and that's what I do when I watch Gilmore Girls. So in the last couple weeks I've been working on a few spreads. I'll pop up some pictures of them in a sec but so the last time that I was showing scrapbook pages on the channel I, I realized that I, I had to omit some of them that I would have otherwise shown because I was holding them up and I was like okay well some of these have things on them because of the nature of sort of like print memorabilia right like some of this is going to have like personal details on it like I remembered there was a page that I wanted to show but it had a boarding pass on it and I googled it I was like is it safe to post boarding pass to internet after flight, right? Like you can't steal my spot on the flight. Like what, does, it, does it matter? And that's how I learned that actually the barcode on boarding passes, if you scan it, contains a lot more personal information than is physically printed. So do not post your boarding passes online because people can get a lot of information about you from that barcode do not recommend. But so knowing that, that time I was like, okay, well, I guess I just won't show that page. But the more pages I scrapbook, the more I'm running into like, 
I don't know if I want that little bit on there. I don't know if I want, like I'm starting to have to omit a lot of pages that I would otherwise like to show you. So I've concluded I'm just gonna start using photos instead because photos I can easily just like blur out a little spot. Whereas with video, I am not in the business of blurring out things that are like moving as I'm holding them. Like in the creative realm, like there is like nothing I respect more than beautiful animation in part because I cannot animate even the most basic thing to save my life without ending up like in tears. Like I just, there's something about motion graphics that just works so counter to my brain. So I will not be doing that. I'll be popping up still photos. And if you do any kind of animation work whatsoever, you are my hero because I love it so much and I absolutely can't do it. So I'm glad that you do. Congratulations on being a genius. So this is one of the spreads I've been working on these last couple weeks. And if you've been here for a while, you may recognize some of the marbled papers that I made with my nephew Chase back in May when he came to visit. And I said at the time that I'm hoping to use some of these papers as backgrounds for my scrapbook pages. And I was like, well, what better thing to scrapbook with it than the time that he came over and we made these pages. So here are some pictures from that visit where we were actually doing the paper marbling and some pictures from a separate visit where I went to their house and was looking after my niece and nephew for a few days while their parents were away. I took them to see the movie Wish. Again, shout out animation. I love animation so much. And just sort of some games and crafts we were doing around the house while I was there. And also pictures from one of McKinley's cheer competitions where we ran into Sarah Landry, aka the Bird's Papaya, who is a very successful influencer who lives sort of like semi-locally. My sister and I both follow her and we were both like, Oh my god that's her should we go say hi can we go say hi <laughs> so that's us meeting her she was very sweet like if you follow her and think like is she as nice as she seems a thousand percent yes she is so yeah this is just a spread from a few different family visits and i've also been working on a few spreads of a trip to mexico that i took last year with a few of my friends so i kind of have this problem where my best friends are my friends from high school so we all grew up local to each other but everyone has really dispersed in the years since so the four of us are now spread across three different provinces which I mean, if you're unaware, Canada is extremely large and we are therefore very far apart from each other. Like to all be in the same room, people have to get on planes unless they're going to be driving for multiple days. And last year we were like, we have not all been in the same room since 2018, which is five years ago. And that was when Amy, which this is the Amy I've referenced on the channel many times. She is one of my friends who knits. She is one of the ones who kind of got me into knitting, like a combination of her kind of inspiring me. Oh, there really are nice, cool, very modern things you can knit. And Graham's being the one who actually taught me the knitting. So back in 2018, Amy got married. So we were all together for that. And then just, we were far apart. There was a pandemic, flights are expensive. And all of this added up to the fact that we hadn't been in the same room in five years. And we were like, if we have to fly anyway, should we just go on vacation? So we decided to meet up at a resort in Mexico to spend a week together and it was just so nice. Like we've been doing sort of regular, like every sort of two weeks-ish video calls. So we're still very much in touch with each other, but of course it is not the same as being in the same room with your friends. Being together on vacation for a week was like magical. And these are the scrap of pages that I've made so far from pictures and other memorabilia from that trip. And I still have a little bit more to do. You can also see in this one, these are pictures from us taking a macrame class that they were offering at the resort. Um, and we had various feelings about how well that was going. It was also funny because, so when this happened, you know, I, I had already been knitting for like a year and a half and obviously there's a relation there in that they're both sort of like fiber arts. And one of the things that I learned that does translate is that much like how my knitting gauge is always tight, my macrame is also tight. So I'm like looking over what other people are doing and I'm like, why is mine so much smaller than yours? Even though we're all using the same materials and, um, yeah, I just, I'm uptight, what can I say? All right, that's all I've got for you today. I think this might be kind of a short one, but honestly, that's for the best because I'm recording this much more last minute than usual. I'm actually recording this Saturday morning. Usually I post Saturday morning. So I'm recording this today with the hopes of actually doing the whole editing process today and then posting it tomorrow morning. Usually I record like a week, week and a half before I actually post so that I can spread out the like editing and thumbnail and transcript process because it is very time consuming, like much more so than just the filming itself. But these last couple weeks, we've not had that luxury. So here we are, very last minute. Maybe it's a short one. Maybe it's a short enough one that'll save me some time in editing. I would not be upset about that. So thank you so much for coming in it with me today. So if you'd like to be here next time, I hope you'll consider subscribing if you're not already. If you're already subscribed, you're my favorite. And I'll see you next time. Bye.